There was a seizure-like attack reported in the New England Journal of Medicine on 115.09. It may have been dose-related to Ibogaine. However, if you looked at that case, this is where you have to be careful. We know that alcohol, if I stop an alcoholic patient, he's going to have a risk of seizure, the higher risk of seizures being at 48 to 72 hours. So to take an alcoholic and not detox him from alcohol first and use Ibogaine as a source of detox while they're still alcohol dependent may be dangerous. They may have a seizure-like activity. And if you look at this patient, alcohol is involved here and the seizure occurred at 72 hours. I don't believe it was due to the Ibogaine. The same thing occurs with benzodiazepine patients. If you're going to leave them on their benzos and say, okay, you're going to stay on clonapine, clonazepam, you need to keep those benzos aboard during the 24 hours or you're going to make them more seizure prone. Also, you have to deal with the hypertension. So we give these patients large amounts of fluids, normal saline, ringer's lactate, prior to treatment, usually one to two liters. We also throw in some potassium due to the possibility of the TWIT. We, not, we're not sure, but we don't throw in enough to make anybody hyperkalemic. But if, in fact, it is affecting potassium levels, we like to have some extra potassium on board. And we're adding magnesium sulfate. The treatment of tersades to the point of prolonged QT syndrome leading to tersades is magnesium. So given the magnesium can't hurt the patient, and it's given prophylactically to prevent tersades. So some of the observations, that cardiac, there's a cardiac irritability that may be related to the drug of abuse being taken prior to Ibogaine administration, increasing adverse cardiac side effects. I believe those patients on methamphetamines or abusing stimulant drugs are more prone to cardiac excitability as opposed to patients who are on opiates. Give me a patient who's addicted to nothing but opiates and Ibogaine as a slam dunk. Changes in ST and T wave morphology anecdotally noted occurring from peak Ibogaine levels, conversion of Ibogaine to nor Ibogaine is when we see these bizarre T wave abnormalities. So it's something happening from the metabolism of nor Ibogaine to Ibogaine. I can look at the EKG and know when I see those changes occur exactly where that person is in their progress and know when it's going to be over. And I've seen people be through, done with this whole treatment in 12 hours and other patients take 24 to 36 hours. Typically, within 12 hours, patients can get up and are into the you know, thinking, working phase of treatment and past the visionary phase. Ibogaine and its metabolites may be acting on cardiac calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium channel blockers. Uh, we talked about the different types of slow average rapid hepatic metabolizers. There are genetic tests you can do which would tell you what type of hepatic metabolizers there are, but it's really not important because that in itself is not really dangerous. The question is, does the different type of metabolism change the way the amount of noribogaine that's going to, to be produced or affect how long the, the post-acute withdrawal syndrome, is, this anti-craving effect is going to last for? Again, you want to screen out the small percentage of the population that has genetic prolonged QT syndrome. So besides getting an EKG, in the, in the optimal world, getting a 24-hour Holter monitor, that, that means a 24-hour cardiogram, it's an inexpensive test, will show you if that patient has any, number one, atrial ectopy, ventricular ectopy, pro, episodes of prolonged QT syndrome and bradycardia. It may make you want to reconsider treating those patients. So I like to get EKGs full metabolic workup, SMAC18, CBCs, looking for um, especially liver enzymes. If liver enzymes are two and a half times normal, I worry about how those patients may metabolize Ibogaine knowing that Ibogaine is hepatically metabolized. So as a rule, in our study, if your liver enzymes were two and a half times elevated, we excluded you. I'm not saying that's an absolute exclusion criteria. Certainly anybody who's noted to have prolonged QT syndrome prior to taking Ibogaine should not take Ibogaine. Many drugs, hundreds of drugs, and nutraceuticals and foods are known to be QT prolongers. All the mycin drugs, erythromycin, many antihistamines like Seldane. There was a basketball player by the name of Len Bias who took an antibiotic, um, azithromycin, and the antihistamine seldane before playing the game of professional basketball and dropped dead at the age of 26 years old 
because he had two QT prolonging drugs on board, went into Tersad's and had sudden death. Grapefruits, quinine, extremely potent QT prolongers. These are substances that need to be avoided when giving Ibogaine. So if you don't know, if you're giving a patient Ibogaine, look at the list of all QT prolonging drugs and make sure the patient has at least two to three half-lives away from any of those drugs. Pre-screening should include a CBC full electrolytes, renal functions, liver function tests, thyroid function tests. I'd say I've picked up approximately, out of every 100 patients, 2% were hypothyroid prior to Ibogaine treatment. Serum magnesium levels need to be checked. Get a complete medical and family history. Understanding of polypharmacy of all drugs and other substances, legal and illegal, regardless of the route of administration and clients, systems before and at time of treatment. There's drug of abuse screening. And we, you know, there's qualitative and there's quantitative. If you're worried about certain drugs of abuse in the patient system, you can always do quantitative testing, seeing if the levels are going down. Instead of getting a yes or no on the light, so I can get back a level from a lab in 24 hours if need be. Again, caution with all centrally acting CNS drugs, including clonidine, which is a centrally acting drug, many blood pressure medications, beta blockers, all psychotropic drugs need to be discontinued. And what, if have, what if I have a patient who's schizophrenic and is on Haldol and I can't take them off the drug? Well, that's not a good candidate to be treated in, in the first place. If they can't be taken off their psychiatric medication, then don't treat that patient. But we don't know what's going to happen if we have those psych drugs, those centrally acting drugs on board when Ibogaine is administered. Be careful with all cytochrome P452 D6 drugs. And these lists of drugs are printable on the internet and literally they go up to 800 different substances and drugs. Watch out for drugs with long-acting half-lives, oxycontin, fentanyl patches, methadone, LAM, depot injections. Switch over to short-acting med medications, specifically when patients are taking methadone or buprenorphine, and switch to short-acting opiates. We suggest all patients have EKGs, 24-hour Holter monitors, caution with benzodiazepine withdrawals, Caution with alcohol-dependent patients, stabilize them first. Remember, it's patient selection, patient selection, patient selection. And one size does not fit all.